Welcome to the Derek Diamond Experience podcast, where every week I talk about the inner workings of the entertainment industry with those who have lived it and experienced it. I am your host, Derek Diamond, and I'm really excited about this week's episode. For the most part, you know, longtime listeners of the show know that for the most part, I discuss film and television on the podcast. This week, we're going to pivot to video games. I'm going to be chatting with voice actress Jen Taylor, who you may know as the voice of Cortana in the Halo series. And Halo was a, a video game series that I grew up with. You know, I was in high school when Halo 1 came out for the original Xbox. And we get into it in the conversation, but uh, younger gamers or, you know, listeners of the show that might also play video games or at least familiar with them, they may not realize how big of a deal Halo was when it came out. So it was really great to kind of pick Jen's brain about the build up to the release and her experience being Cortana um, in the series. And uh, there are certain topics that we could not talk about, which you'll hear about uh, in the conversation uh, due to uh, the Screen Actors Guild being on strike. So I still thank Jen very much for her time in getting to chat with her about her role in Halo and also some other voices that she's done as well. She's played multiple characters in the Super Mario Brothers series. So if you're a fan of video games, you're going to love this episode. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Jen Taylor. Happy to be here with my very special guest this week, actress Jen Taylor. Jen, how are you? I'm great. I am great. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. We were just talking uh, before we started recording. You were sort of in my neck of the woods uh, this past <laughs> weekend. You were in, in Tampa for uh, for a convention. And how yes, how, how was it? Convention. How was it? Uh, the convention was great. It was great. It was really busy. It was it was nice and um, a sort of slow constant so I got to actually talk to everybody because there are some conventions where you really have such a small amount of time you don't have time to do that so it was nice that I got to actually have conversations with everybody it was nice the weather was atrocious I don't know how as I said I don't know how you guys do that um, but we were inside almost the entire time so but Tampa is kind of a cute little area actually the area that we were in it was nice it was sunny it was it was lovely yeah, and it's interesting because Florida is really like a tale of two states. When you get to like Tampa and Orlando, that's the Florida that most people think of with, you know, the palm trees, the theme parks, right. the warm weather. And then you get where I live, where it's we live in like a very touristy town. Um, there's a lot of okay. um, trees, um, some farmland. So it's really like two different states almost. It sounds like it. Yeah. But no, that that's cool. And I, I did want to ask you as someone who you know attends conventions, what is it like for you as as a guest to meet fans that you know are fans of your work and they might you know be inspired by something that you did? Like how how is that experience of meeting with fans? Um, it's really the only time that I get to talk about the games or the projects that I do. Right, I don't really get to to talk about them very much. And so it's fun to check in with people to see also we're sharing, you know, it's a shared experience, right? These games. And so it's, it's cool to get to talk to people about how it has affected them. It's lovely. And it is an honor to be a part of it. It's a privilege to feel like I'm connected to it, especially because, um, you know, the few games that I've worked on in my world have been very, um, important to me. I mean, they've been very, I, I feel like I'm proud of them. You know what I mean? If that makes sense. So, uh, so I feel proud to talk about it, especially, you know, most people at this point want to talk about Halo and I feel really proud to be a part of that project um, and a part of that world. So it's fun. It's yeah. fun. Yeah. that That's fantastic. And it, it's, I remember hearing, you know, growing up about <clears throat> San Diego Comic-Con and how all the celebrities would gather. That's where they'd unveil a lot of, you know, upcoming you big projects and things like that, but you really now, not just here in the United States, but all over the world, you have these conventions that, you know, guests mm. like yourself and others get to go to. So it gives people an opportunity, you know, if I, like say, if I have one close to me that I could meet people that, you know, I grew up idolizing their work and I don't have to 
to fly to the other side of the country in order right. to do it. So has right. that been something that has been a, a cool factor for you as well? Because you get to see all kinds yeah. of cool places too. Yeah, I'm going to Dublin next. Just about to go to Dublin. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's cool. I get to see different parts of the world, the country mostly, but um, I've also gone to Australia and New Zealand. I went to um, Wales. I'm going to Dublin. I'm going to London later. So um, I, it's, I mean, what a gift. It's a gift. It's just a gift I've been given and I take it that way. So yeah, it's really great. And also different parts of the United States that I might not normally go to, honestly. Um, it's good. Yeah. It's lovely. It's a, just a great way to explore our country and see how the other people live. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You, you, get, know? you get to kind of immerse yourself in different cultures. You know, like the Northeast mm. is obviously much different than the West Coast. The Southeast right. is different than the Northwest. So it's it's really, really, really cool. Uh, you mentioned Halo, and I do want to talk about Halo because I, I grew up in that generation where I can remember when Halo 1 came out like it was yesterday. Mm. But mm. Uh, so what what was it that initially made you want to get into acting in the first place? acting oh my goodness that was so long ago um i was always the kid who was performing for my parents i was doing puppet shows or or i made you know this back in the day we got a vhs recorder like we had a camera and i would run around filming making my friends do you know play cinderella or whatever um and so I feel like that's always been a part of me. I just didn't know it was a thing you could do like for real until I was probably 10 or 11, maybe even 12. And I saw, I saw a play at a local theater near, um, in the town that I grew up in and it was all kids. And I thought, wait, what? I, I could do that. I could do this. Um, and I got involved that way. And I was, I was just telling the story the other day. I had a friend who was in a, a little girl singing group <laughs> called the shrimps. That's what I remember that. And I was 13 or 14, 13 probably. And one of them went on vacation. And so they needed a sub. And so I subbed and they would perform at community events like parades and, and whatnot. Right. So we were performing at some outdoor community event. My mom said she sat there watching me and went, she thought, Oh no, she's, She's not just a ham. She's actually talented. What, what am I going to do with that? <laughs> so I got involved in theater. I did theater in high school. And um, again, we had this local theater that I worked at and did whatever I could. I would do anything. You want me to hang lights? Sure, I'll climb a ladder and hang lights. I'll run the spotlight. I'll work in the box office. I'll clean the theater. I did whatever I could to just be a part of it. And then I went on to study theater at uh, Northwestern University outside Chicago. And then I graduated and didn't know what to do because how do you prepare for that? <laughs> you know? So yeah. That, I, so it started a long time ago. Yeah. And I, a lot of us can relate to that is, you know, you go to college and you think you've got everything figured out and then you go out in the real world and you're like, what uh, do I do? Uh, help, yeah. please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and exactly. that's, that's really cool because, you know, I, I primarily talk about film and working on film sets on this podcast but mm. it, it, it works with theater as well you mentioning that hey if you want me to hang lights I'll do that if you want me to work in the box office it, it's important if even if there's something specific that you want to do you can still learn other aspects that are around it because oh, yeah. you one you get to be a part of the team and you also gain another appreciation for what you know, a, a lighting person might do or someone who works in ticketing or, you know, just a, a simple stagehand or like in, on a film set, a PA, you get to right. see how the whole process works. Right. Right. I think the PAs actually are the people truly in charge. I mean, they're the ones who are everywhere, right? They, I feel like they're running the show, really. They're the, the boots on the ground, man. It's fascinating to watch them because yeah. a lot of times they'll be observing what's going on and then you ask them to do something and it's like that it's it's done or it's already done yeah, yeah it's already like, done. No, they've I took already care of anticipated it. that yeah right. yeah 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 no it's fantastic so you said you graduated from college and you weren't mm -hmm. quite sure what you were going to do yet so mm -hmm. how did you then get into 
acting and specifically voice acting? Sure. I bummed around Europe. <laughs> That's what I did. I went, huh, what do I do? I'm going to go to Europe. And I mean, I spent the summer working, raising as much money as I could. And then I went to Europe and I dinked around for about a year, saw as many plays in London as I possibly could. Um, and then I ran home. I, I ran home. No, I ran out of money. So I went home. Uh, and I was working. I went back to that same box office and I got a job back in the box office and there was um, a theater nearby that was doing uh, a, not that theater but a, a different theater that was doing a play and somebody had asked me to audition and I got sucked right back in because I didn't know what I was going to do you know I thought okay I have this theater degree but is that really something that I can do and um, I started back in Seattle I started auditioning and you know doing French theater and and my best friend at the time, um, still one of my best friends, said to me, you know, I think you'd be really good at voiceover. And she was doing voiceover audition. She was doing voiceovers. And she worked for this radio station called Kidstar. And she said, I know some people at Kidstar. You could come in and audition. And, and I did. And I remember they just turned on the mic and said, show me what you got. Just do some characters for me. And so I was like, oh, Okay. So I just started messing around on the mic and they said, you know, marvelous. We'll, we'll cast you to do, um, out of house, what do they call it? Out of house commercials for them. So, you know, they pay you like $25 a commercial and you do as many spots as they, you know, you come in once a week or once a month and you do as many spots as they need you to do. Um, and then from there, they asked me to be a radio DJ. And so I became a radio DJ and I was a DJ for about six months before Disney bought it, took it over. This is back in the day. <laughs> um, so Disney bought it. So we were all fired and I got a job at an independent rock station. I worked there for a while. Meanwhile, I had sort of fallen into this world of auditioning for voiceovers and I was getting some and I was, I started out getting a lot of um, games like, computer games for little kids, like teaching them how to count and how to read and stuff like that. I played a lot of fish and <laughs> like, you know, teaching kids how to, how to spell. So, um, uh, and then it just went from there. And I, as far as video games go, I truly believe that it was being in the right place at the right time. And also being an actor, there was a, trained as an actor, there was a time when most people doing voiceovers were announcers. They just announced, they were just doing announcing work. And so video games, it was a, it was a while. Now it's ubiquitous. They're everywhere. All actors want to do, I think, want to do video games, right? It's a, it, it's something we all know about, but back in the day, it, they were still trying to find their place and there weren't a lot of video games like Halo yet with such a big storyline. And so um, they were looking for actors who were also voice actors. And I just truly landed in the right place at the right time. So that's how that and happened, it, I think. And it's interesting because, you know, the the audience will not have heard this yet, but before I started this conversation with you, I was interviewing another actor. And it's similar how you both went away from from the the acting world. And in your case, you know, you went to Europe, but then it, yeah. it almost was pulling you back in or it was mm -hmm. calling right. back to you. So it's it's in a way like the industry chooses you in a way. Like it, it's it's what you're meant to do. And you find out in just the most subtle ways. It's funny. I never really considered anything else. I mean, I tried to, my parents are both in this, you know, STEM world. And so they were like, please, please, please get a job and just let acting be something you do for fun. Please, right. you know, make some money so that we don't have to worry about you. Um, so yeah, I, I never really, that was never really a choice for me. I just didn't know how I was going to make it work. Especially living in Seattle, you know, living in LA and New York, there are a lot more opportunities for people, but I didn't want to live in either of those cities. Um, I like to visit those places and then leave. So I, I really didn't know how I was going to make a, a life as an actor in Seattle. So I, I just got lucky. 
Yeah. And, and timing is very important too. You know, you can yes. have all the talent in the world, but there has to be that almost that little perfect moment that mm. just spawns everything else. I think so. I mean, I think about the day I auditioned for Halo. What a remarkable day that was. And I had no idea. Like, what did I eat for breakfast that day? I wish I had journaled that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you so know? 20 years later, here we are. Yeah. So so talk to me about Halo, because you, you mentioned you know, other gaming parts that you've had. You've been a part of, you know, the Super Mario Brothers series and, yeah. and others, which is which is great. You know, Mario is such a like he's the father of video right. games like people right. always know who mario is but the thing with a lot of those games at that time is that voice acting was really just starting to become a thing like with some games you have, might have little little bits of dialogue ah, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah or sound right. effects like that but <laughs> right. halo is the first game that i remember is almost like an event like you you have your big budget movies like your marvel movies that they feel like events Halo, you know, I remember seeing the, the first trailer for it, and even then it just felt different. You, mm. It felt didn't feel like any other type of video game. Like, it almost felt like a movie. And I know since, you know, it's been turned into right. a, to a show on Paramount, but I remember getting Halo on opening night and going mm. back to a friend's house, and we played that game till the sun came up. I love it. So how, how was it for you? Like, did you have you or anyone else involved with the project have any idea that it was going to be as big as it was? I don't think so. I mean, I've talked about this with Marty and he said they were just hoping to make basically like back, hoping they'd make back what they'd spent on it. Right. Like to break even was sort of, I think what they were hoping. And, you know, I mean, I'm sure they had dream, bigger dreams than that, but, but that was sort of like, if we can just <laughs> break even, <laughs> maybe we can do something else. Um, no, I had no idea. I mean, I had done, I did a lot of one-off games, like where I just, you know, so the thing that I did feel connected to was the story. I felt like this is an interesting story. And um, I, I wanted to know more, but honestly, at that time, you really, I think for Halo, I just got my lines. So I didn't see what else was happening, but they were telling me about, you know, they were informing me like, okay, so this is what's happening here. And this is just, and this is a cut scene and blah, blah, blah. And here's where we're going. And so just in the description of it, it felt like interesting storytelling to me. And it also was very clear to me that these people who were making this game were actually gamers themselves who knew what they wanted, the knew the kind of game they wanted to play that wasn't out there yet. And so they were creating the game that they had want, they wanted to play. Um, and that's not always the case when you're playing, when you're making video games, you know, I, I mean, a lot of people are doing it for different reasons, but that was a really interesting time to be involved with Bungie. Um, so, uh, but outside of that, I didn't know it was a hit. I didn't know that people, I, I had no idea that people were, the, we're having the experience that you had. We're anticipating it. Um, they called me and, you know, a few years later and said, hey, we're going to do a Halo 2. And I thought, oh, well, I guess Halo 1, because I didn't know what it was. You know, I guess Halo 1 was a hit. That's cool. I had no idea. I had no idea. And then um, Halo 2 and was then, an even bigger hit and then so on and so forth. Yeah. And that was the first time I went to... Um, uh, E3, I think was E3 around or something mm -hmm. like yep. the, maybe the precursor. E3. That was, I went to that and saw, like, I think they had a table for me or something. And I just thought, oh, 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 this is a, th this is a thing. This is a thing. Um, and then again, sort of spaced it out. And then <laughs> the third one was where I really started to realize what a big deal it was. I think it, it took me, it took me a while. Slow learner, slow learner hey. there. But it's it's insane too, even the the staying power that it's had. And I know there have been other games, you know, outside of that original trilogy and Halo Reach. Mm. But that that original game and and Halo Two especially are games that people still talk about, you know, decades later. It's just yeah. it's one of those once in a lifetime things that you know it's almost like this generation's Mario Brothers. The, it, it's that, mm -hmm. that game changing 
franchise that then inspires other you know, future installments and other future franchises. Right. right. It was funny today. My husband was trying to teach my mom how to play, <laughs> which was really fun to go back and listen to. My mother was, you know, trying to figure out how to use, she was, you know, doing master chief collection and just trying to figure out how to use the, the controller and okay, I got to look over here and how do people do that? And it was so slow and it was really fun to watch her play. Cause she's never, she's never seen it. It's never been something. I mean, she knows that I work on it, but it's not something that she really knows anything about. So that was really fun to watch. Oh, today. that's, that's fantastic. So, I bet that was afternoon. amazing to watch. Yeah, it was. So uh, Back talk- there, tweet some photos from that. It was pretty charming. You should. People will love that. <laughs> People will love that. Mom. <laughs> Mom experiencing Halo. You right. I love it. Uh, so talk to me about what you knew about the Cortana character herself. When you, when you got the role, how much influence did you have with giving that character a voice? Did the, the developers have a concrete idea or did you get to kind of add your own little nuances to the character? Oh, I think they had a pretty clear idea of what they wanted. And they had said to me, this needs to be, this is not a romantic relationship. This is the girl next door. She's also needs to be easy to listen to because you're going to be giving a lot of information. And you're also going to be like trying to get his butt moving. Like, come on, buddy, let's go. Come on. And we need you to still be, it still needs to be easy to listen to. Basically, it was one of the main things they had said to me. But also, you know, you're, you're on an adventure together. You're, uh, you're, um, I don't want to say colleagues, but you're, you know, you're, you're in this together alone and you're the only people or the only beings that you can, you know, basically you can rely on on, and you become so connected. Um, That was really all I knew. I also knew that they had styled her after Nefertiti. Right. Um, so that's what I knew. And as far as how much influence, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to talk to the developers of the game. I always pushed the snark. I was always like, oh, come on, let me be more sarcastic and snarky. And, but I don't know how much that actually affected them. I would try to put that online so that it probably wasn't supposed to be. (laughs) Um, but no, I'd have to sit down with Joe and Marty and be like, how much did I actually influence it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. You can't have enough snarkiness with Cortana. It's good for master chief. In my opinion, that is true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and that's, what's so interesting about the dynamic between those two characters is again, taking from almost cinematic elements, you have, you know, this, the Spartan who's a loner and then you have the artificial intelligence, but they have to rely on each other to, to meet this objective and, and survive. But it it really is at its heart. It's, it's like a, I don't want to say, buddy buddy, it's like a buddy movie. Yeah. That's, that's exactly the comparison I was going to use. It's like a buddy cop, you know, like the, the odd couple type of thing, like characters you would not expect to be together, but they are what each other needs in order to survive. Right. Well, and in the beginning of Halo, I don't know how much you recall about it, but she's been in this ship. She's been running mm-hmm. this, you know, the Pillar of Autumn, and now she's in this tiny, it's cramped. She's like, Ugh, I don't have nearly as much control. This is not high functioning. I don't want to be here. And, and it's become, you know, it becomes something else. But in the beginning, it's, they both are uncomfortable and unhappy about the situation and learn to not only rely on each other, but respect and love each other, you know, like you would any, anybody in the trench with you, you know, your buddy who's in there with you. And I think that's what it, that's what it is for me, at least when I'm experiencing it. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, there's a lot to like about Halo. There's, you know, obviously the great visuals, uh, the gameplay is great, but, really what it comes down to and we've talked about it is the story that encompasses the whole trilogy and it's like with movies at the core of every great movie is a great story it's the same thing with gaming you know when i play video games i like to be entrenched in the Mm storylines and that's i think what's made halo such a staying power i would agree i think the story is beautiful and they've uh and well calculated you know, 
they figured out what they wanted to say. I'm not sure that they even knew they were going to make a Halo 2 at the beginning. I think they just were going to do one. That was the plan. So the fact that they figured out how to make it work in a cohesive way from a place where they had no intention of moving, you know, moving beyond that. was really interesting. Yeah. You know, no, cause I- it feels, they feel part of, part of a whole, you know, they, they're part of something. So it's interesting that they are able to do that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I, I do have to ask, you know, we mentioned Halo. There was a, a show on um, Paramount plus uh, yeah. it, it had been, talked about for years whether or not there's going to be a halo movie or a halo series and it finally happened uh, what what did you think of it oh well, i'm in it oh yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, how did yeah. you think it like how do you think it turned out you know because the, the hype I, had been there for so long for that right. to happen how, how how was the experience of being a part of that aspect of the franchise so this is hard because we're on strike Right. The SAG after strike. Okay. So I'm not really supposed to talk about the TV show. Okay. I had a gr- I had a great time working on it though. I will tell you that. I had a marvelous time. It was a little dream come true for me to be dropped into that world cuz I the sets are beautiful, all of that was That's as much as I'm going to say. Yeah. Um yeah. Well, I, I can always go back and cut this out. So but thank you for for bringing that up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. I don't mind talking about, you know, the fact that we're on strike cuz this yeah. has AI and we need yeah. to, you know, we need to figure this out before we move forward. Yeah. Um, and I fear it's going to last a long time. I'm wondering, I'm really curious to see. Yeah. Well, let's, so, let's hope it doesn't. Let's, let's hope it doesn't. Yeah. Um, I did want to ask, you know, as, as we start to, to wrap up here, you're recognized, you know, you, primarily for Cortana, but you've done some other roles as well. Yeah. Um, what, what was it like being, a part of the Super Mario Brothers series specifically, because you you got to voice uh, Princess Peach, Toad, and some other characters. Uh, what was it like being a part of, you know, probably the most recognized gaming franchise of all time? Oh, it was silly fun. I mean, you go in for one session; it's maybe three hours long, and you're just getting to play, make silly noises, how like wow, you know, like do all of the. I'm the best all this silly stuff that they get to do um and not worry too much about you know you want to give them as many options as possible but not worry too much about story because it's not it, that that's less important for these games right um so it's like throwing a whole bunch of paint against the wall is what it feels like as opposed to worrying about how the you know what the form is and what the shades are it's just more about throwing it all against the wall and them using the best thing that they can find for the silly craziness that year. I remember one day, I think it was Mario Kart and I'm playing Toad because we always did Toad at the end because it's hard on your voice. And at the end, they're like, thanks so much, Jen. And, and they're always so nice and just sort of let me go. They'd set the script down in front of me and say, you know, give us two or three takes of everything and just just go for it. We'll stop you if we want something different or more or whatever. And so I would just play in the room. And um, at the end, they said, great. Well, that was so lovely. Thank you so much. And, and they would let me improv a little bit sometimes. Like, give us a, another sound for frustration or another line where you're just, you know, you, you're mad at the player or whatever, you know, it was. Um, but at the end, I said, isn't this amazing? This is my job. You're paying me. And they all laughed, you know, because I was like, what a remarkable thing that I get to do. So um, that was a fun one too. I mean, it was interesting the way that I got that job was that I could imitate the woman who did it before me. That was what they wanted. They wanted somebody who could transition from that voice in a way that wouldn't be too jarring to the people who are playing the game. So, um, and I think, you know, that happens at first and then you move away and you create, it becomes more of your own. But in the beginning, that's really what they were hoping for was, can you sound like this other person? So yeah, mimic, that, mimicry, mimicry is key in voiceover. So. Yeah. And it's, it's great that you say that too, because you, you, I've personally never noticed any difference in like, I know now that you different people have voiced these characters, Yeah, but if you go through from when the voices first started up to now, they really don't sound different. 
Good. And I think that's really, really cool. Good, good. Yeah, good. Well, and again, we're not having to, you know, read a whole scene of heart, you know, heartbreak and loss. And we're just mad or sad or, you know, happy or whatever. So it's more about betraying, you know, like portraying an emotion. So it's, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. A, little, a little bit easier as far as that goes. Storytelling yeah. goes. Yeah. Well, as we start to wrap up here, I did want to ask you, uh, do you have a website or social media that you'd like to plug so the viewers and listeners can follow you? I don't have a website. I'm lame. I should. I should have something like that. Um, I'm on Twitter at Jen Taylor Town or X, I guess that it is now. Whatever it's called today. Yeah, whatever it is today. Elon. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I'm. I have just sort of come over to Instagram and I think it's the same. I think it's Jen Taylor town, but I haven't really posted anything yet. I'm right now I'm lurking. I'm a lurker and I mostly look at pit bulls. I'll be honest. Oh, that's the best thing about Instagram is looking oh. at dogs. Oh my God. All the dogs, all the dogs. Yes. Well, and that's the thing too, is that like you can ha- be having the worst day ever and you find the best dog video on Instagram. Mm-hmm. You're instantly mm-hmm. better. <laughs> it's like, it's like quick therapy. That's what it should be called. Insta better. Yeah, Insta better. Mm-hmm. It's like mm-hmm. a, a shot of a positive energy. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I like it. Awesome. Well, Jen, thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview and uh, safe travels to Ireland. Thank you, Derek. Have a lovely day. Thank you again to Jen Taylor for coming on the show to have that awesome conversation. It was great to pick her brain about the Halo franchise. Be sure to follow her on Instagram and Twitter or X. I still call it Twitter. I know it's technically X now, but uh, the link to her pages will be in the show notes. And if you happen to be in Dublin, Ireland this weekend, of course, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, uh, she'll be at the Dublin Comic Con August 12th and 13th. So highly recommend saying hi to her and chatting with her if you are at the convention. For next week, we're going to be pivoting back to the filmmaking side of things with writer-director David Libin, who had uh, his feature film, Publisher Parish, show at the Spotlight International Film Festival in Jacksonville, which I uh, I didn't get to see the movie at the festival, uh, but I did get to attend, as I mentioned last week, um, to watch the feature, so... Um, Briefly got to have some interaction with him, but he's going to come on the podcast to talk about the making of his film. So be sure to come back next week for that really fun episode. But until then, if you want to check out past episodes of the show, if you want to subscribe to me on social media, subscribe to the YouTube channel, find me at linktree.com slash ddiamondpodcast. Everything Derek Diamond Experience related is in one simple location. And if you could, please leave a review. The more reviews the show gets, the more visible it is to those who might be searching for entertainment podcast. It only takes a moment of your time and it doesn't cost anything. So whether it's Apple Podcast or Spotify, if you could, please leave a rating and review. I would very much appreciate it. So that's going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you once again to Jen Taylor. And we'll see you guys back here next Monday for another awesome episode of the Derek Diamond Experience Podcast. Podcast.